All right, we got this guy rolling here. We got it uh, recording. We're uh, very happy that all of you are able to join us this evening. Uh, we're excited to have Brad. Um, we obviously would prefer to have him in person, but uh, you know, things are things are different here. Um, we're in a different time, and uh, uh, we're making do. So, um, again, I really want to just thank everybody for joining us and um, you know we're gonna be doing this probably at least once uh, a month even once we are able to meet in person hopefully maybe uh, August um, we'll be able to re uh, join in uh, in person but uh, this will give us an opportunity to have folks from throughout the state and even country um, join us uh, both as participants and speakers. So it's an exciting thing, exciting opportunity for us. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, you know having uh, more discussions with fe fellow uh, Sabre friends. Um, obviously this is not the year that I had planned as chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento chapter. Um, Next week, we're planning on going to the California League All-Star Game. Obviously, that is not going to happen. But uh, as I said, we're making do um, and definitely appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Uh, Marlene, do you want to say anything uh, to your folks before I uh, introduce Brad? Well, hi, my folks and everybody else. I can't tell you how happy I am to see all of you, um, whether you're you're from the Dusty Baker chapter or the lefties or, or any, any one of you here, it really makes me happy. I've missed you all. Um, a couple of reminders, please keep an eye on this week in Saber. There's lots of news coming out. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Atticus Ginsburg, who's on the call. He is a recent graduate and he is the chair of our student chapter here um, at, at San Jose, in San Jose. So, um, Welcome. I look forward to seeing you again um, on Zoom or in person. Thanks for joining us tonight. And Brad, thanks for being here. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, again, Brad, I uh, really appreciate you joining us. Um, and, you know, we talked right before this, um, you know, everybody met and uh, talked about um, how exciting this project is and it was nice following it, or at least over the last year and a half since I first found out about it, Saber Day in um, the Bay Area. And I gotta say, you're, uh, you know, you don't want to judge a book by its cover, but this is a pretty darn cool cover here. Uh, <laughs> one of the coolest I've ever seen. And, you know, I, I got this book, I was lucky to get this um, in March, and I think um, a lot of us baseball fans have, well, I, I, I have what I call book ADHD. I have a book that I find and I go, oh, this is a great book. You know, I start reading it and uh, another book catches my attention. I go, oh, here's. Hmm. You got muted. <laughs> yeah, we, we lost your audio, Zach. In a week, um, and I was just enthralled. It was a great book, um, and I'm excited to hear a little bit more about it. And uh, Brad, tell us about it. You know, how did you come up with this idea? You know, what uh, what was going through your mind when you you know came up with this premise? Not sure if you're aware, Zach, but we lost you for about 20 seconds there. You looked really. Oh my gosh. Now. <laughs> Whatever you were saying, it was very spirited. It was very spirited. You know, it, well, what I'll say is that, you know, this is a great book and we are happy to have you. Yeah. And um, Hope tell us about, you know, how you <laughs> came up with this idea. No, thank you. Um, so the idea came uh, quite a while ago, back um, about six years ago, where um, I, I always wondered what happened to the guys that I grew up with that, that when I collected cards as a kid in the eighties, you know, I had thousands of baseball cards and I had my whole albums that I would put together, but I was always a little bit weird in that the guys that I liked were the, 
the, the common cards, we called them. So my favorite players were the, the underdogs, the utility guys. And I always wondered, um, I've always liked that where are they now theme. You know, it's, it's such a common or, or appealing theme that Sports Illustrated, I don't know if they're going to do it again this year, but, um, you know, every year they do that where are they now issue, which is always one of my favorite issues of the year. And so I kind of wanted to find a, a way to write about the guys that I grew up with and, and find out what happened to them. And I had the, the inspiration or the idea that a, a single pack of cards would be the perfect device to get a random sample from that era because it, you know, we, we all remember the thrill of not knowing who's going to be in the pack and the, you know, the excitement that that brings. And when you, you know, the way that the cards are put into the packs is completely random. And I actually, you'll see in the book, the book opens and closes set in the Topps factory where the cards were actually manufactured. And I got to interview the people that literally made the cards and describe that process. Um, and you see that it's just a, it's just random who gets, you know, put in the pack. And so I also knew that just by probability, right? Most of the guys that are going to be in, in, the, in a given pack are going to be those kinds of underdog players because they're just more common. So I thought like this would be a great idea to get to write about several of those guys that I grew up as having as my heroes um, if I were to just be at the mercy of a single pack and have that pack kind of determine my fate in terms of who I'm going to write about. Um, but also the to me it was it was more appealing as as an as a narrative for an idea you know i could you could do this kind of book many different ways you could write many types of books i could have just you know tried to call the guys from from my living room and written about them but i really wanted to make this into kind of a, an epic adventure where i actually get out there or get on the road and and have this quest where i'm trying to to track people down and not sure if i'm going to succeed and so there's a certain amount of dramatic tension in the book about, you know, am I going to get to everyone? What, how are they going to react? And as you'll see, I, there are multiple failures and, you know, things that I, I don't get to, I don't get to meet up with everybody. And I think that makes the book more intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was kind of my, the way that I, that I conceived of it and framed it and um, always wanted it to be uh a narrative that it was meant to be read, you know, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So tell me about it. You, you come up with this idea and tell me about the, the process, the, of planning out this trip and reaching out to, you know, the different players and some were pretty quick successes. Some of them you had challenges with. Um, tell us, you know, how long it took to, schedule the trip and how long the trip was and um, some of the challenges and the, the highlights. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a, a biology professor and a freelance writer that usually writes about science. So I didn't go into this with any special connections or sports writing pedigree. So I knew that would make it more challenging, right? That I, you know, I'm going to be cold calling these people and, trying to convince them that I'm not insane and that they should set aside some time to talk to me. And so really it was about 10 months of mapping out, okay, where does everybody live? You know, I was able to, because of the autograph market, I could get addresses for everybody and then subscribe to several databases with people's information. And thankfully, most of these guys were in their fifties and sixties. And so they still have landlines. Like, you know, I don't know how successful I would be if I was trying to track down younger people who may, who may not have them. Um, but my general strategy was write, write a snail mail letter and then follow it up with a phone call or whatever um, means of communication I could, I could find. And uh, some guys, it was, I mean, Rance Mullenix, the first player in the pack, I mean, I just typed into Google Rance Mullenix and immediately there was a match with his um, realtor page. And we all know that the easiest people's phone numbers to get in the world are realtors and their ah. phone numbers are everywhere, right? So within seconds, I had Rance Mullenix's cell phone number. <laughs> uh, so he wasn't hard to find. But on the other end of the spectrum, 
um, someone like Randy Reddy, I just could not, I could not find, I could not get to him. He didn't respond to whatever I sent. And um, I remember I, I was, I was getting pretty deep in the stalker mode. I mean, I was emailing, <laughs> uh, I was emailing like coaches of travel teams in Texas to see if they, you know, had a contact for him and, it was just dead end after dead end. And then I remember I, got, I just lucked out. I decided to do a search on Twitter for Randy Reddy. And there happened to be a, a tweet from a few years ago. So when, when Sony, the company Sony got hacked several years ago, mm -hmm. and there was this major data dump, for some reason, Randy Reddy and several other former baseball players' email addresses showed up in some email that got posted and so I happened to get Randy Reddy's personal email, which I then wrote to and he, he wrote back. So it was just some serendipity, you know, some just good old sleuthing. Um, and then it, sometimes I got turned down. So Carlton Fisk, um, immediate, you know, his or his people told me that he's just not interested. Uh, I got I went through a whole charade to get Vince Coleman. I actually didn't. I don't think I put this in the book, but I actually wrote an article for Rolling Stone about uh, walk up music uh, because Royce Clayton, a play baseball player, was mm -hmm. is now designing walk up music for players, like custom huh. songs. And I, I really like, <laughs> I basically did that whole article just because I knew that Royce Clayton was friends with Vince Coleman. And I knew that I could disguise, and Vince Coleman's in the pack, yeah. I could disguise my interest in Coleman through the article by telling Royce Clayton, hey, I want to interview some guys from the 80s, you know, before walk-up music existed to ask them their opinion on this whole thing. And then once I get Vince Coleman on the phone, I can do a bait and switch and say, hey, I'm writing this book. Can I, can I talk to you? And that, that plan actually worked out really well until the mm -hmm. part where I, Vince Coleman told me, uh, no, I, I have no interest. <laughs> <in talking to." laughs> nice, nice. So I mean, when you're developing, you know, this plan, did you have, obviously there are, ultimately there are certain themes that come out in the book. Did you have particular themes in mind when you were on this journey as far as, you know, father and sons, relationships, yeah, uh, should, some of the other life challenges? I should go back to my book proposal and see what I, what I wrote back then, but I'm pretty sure, uh, the, I mean, I, I didn't know a lot of the themes that ended up becoming central to the book. Um, I was basically proposing it as, uh, is there life after baseball? What happens to these guys when they're done playing? Um, you know, I, I'm, well, I'm 39 now, but I was 34 at the time of the trip. And so all these guys had retired around that same age. So sort of what can I learn as, as someone in my mid thirties and where I am in my life, you know, uh, still single, not no kids, you know, kind of not sure where I'm headed and what, what can I learn from these guys from their experiences since they retired and played play, from playing baseball. Uh, uh -huh. But it really ended up as I went on the trip, these other themes emerged, like, as you were saying, the, you know, how many of these guys had fathers that were really actually abusive or, or, or absent. Uh, oh, there you go. Did I freeze? Yeah, you just, uh, we lost your sound there for just a second. Okay. I was just saying that it wasn't until I went on the road that I, and started meeting guys that I, that I discovered a lot of these other themes that emerged, like the importance of, of the father-son relationship or, um, you know, how many of these guys that were the underdogs ended up becoming sort of more successful in life after baseball. So mm -hmm. uh, I didn't plan on all of that in advance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you kept a blog during this journey. You know, tell me about how difficult that was to keep up on that because you touch on it a little bit, but you know, obviously that's got to be a huge task that you're, you know, un, you know, you're obviously doing the trip, you're do, figuring out the logistics, but you're also spending each night kind of documenting exactly what you did. How long did that take? You know, each night, how much did you focus on that? Yeah, blogging kind of sucks. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's enormously, I mean, it's, it's a great medium um, for kind of structuring your thoughts, but it's really mm -hmm. challenging because I, I had never done that where 
I was writing every single day for the public, you know, and, and um, so what I would do is, you know, I, would, I, was, I drove 11,341 miles, right? So I was on the road some days for, you know, 10 hours. And so it was as much fun as the trip was, it was also exhausting um, doing all that driving. And then, you know, you meet up with a player and then you get, you know, end of the day, you go back to your hotel room and now you've got to crank out, you know, 800 words that are compelling and, you know, engaging, but also not telling the whole story because you don't want to write the whole book as a, as the blog. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it was it was tough at the same time it was actually really helpful because when i finished i had well first of all it helped kind of drum up interest from people on social media but also um i had this sort of structure in place that i could say okay you know this is what happened these are the major things that happened on each day and when i sat down to finally write the book which was actually most of it i wrote much later mm -hmm. because it took a long time to get a book deal um I actually would use the blog entries to kind of help structure how I wanted to write the chapters. And the way that I laid out every chapter was almost cinematically, like thinking of each chapter as having four to six scenes, because you'll see the book is very, it's literary nonfiction. It's very much about describing the people and the characters and the environment and the setting and all of that. And so in my mind, I was thinking, okay, if I had, you know, two days with Don Carmen, what are the four or five scenes that best uh, uh, depict the meaning of that chapter that I want to get across? Because there was a lot, you know, when you do this kind of book, you only use 5% of the material that you gather through the interviews and the research and all of that. So mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of it ends up on the floor. Um, but the process of figuring out what belongs and where it belongs is kind of the you know, that's part of the artistry of that kind of writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell us about some of the stuff that didn't make the book that uh, you experienced on the trip. Well, um, what would be a couple of the things that, you know, it stand out <laughs> to you more than others? It, it ranged a lot from being propositioned by a prostitute in, uh, in, uh, in Hollywood. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't put that in the book because it wasn't really relevant, although it was mm -hmm. kind of funny. Um, uh, to meeting up with the Iron Sheik, my professional wrestling childhood idol in Fayetteville, Georgia for an afternoon and uh, re reconnecting with him. And that's a whole nother story about that I briefly allude to the Iron Sheik. I tried to write a book about him 15 years ago and he threatened to kill me. And it was uh, a, whole, a whole nother story. Um, and then, um, I, mean, there was, I mean, there were a lot of sh small things, right? Like Rance Mullenix, he told some really fun, great stories about playing on the Blue Jays and stories about how, you know, he hated Dennis Eckersley because Eckersley would always like, you know, point, point at him after he struck him out or he was really demonstrative. And then, you know, things like one time Tom Henke asking for an autograph for his son to going, going over and asking Jose Canseco for an autograph and Canseco blowing him off. And then Hanky, all of this ha is being passed back and forth through clubhouse boys who are giving notes back and forth. <laughs> and and uh, Hanky sends a note back that says, if you don't sign this autograph for my kid, I'm going to, I'm going to fit a ball in the ear hole of your helmet um, later on today. So, you know, I mean, stories like that, that were, that were kind of fun. But again, I, I was always trying to think if it doesn't, you know, to me, the most important thing in any piece of writing is the meaning. Uh -huh. And I would try to figure out what is the meaning in only a word or two of, of every chapter. And if it didn't fit that meaning, then it, as much as it pained me to not share some of those things, I had to cut it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, tell me about that process after, you know, you, you put your book together and, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, a quick grab by the publishers. Tell me about... Uh, That's a nice euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about uh, that process, what you went through, and ultimately how you uh, found uh, University of Nebraska Press. Right. Well, I could wallpaper the wall behind me with the rejection notes. Um, so it took... Uh, it, the reason why... So the trip happened in 2015, 
and the book didn't get published until this year, uh, mostly because it took several years just to get a publisher. Um, so if any of you guys are considering writing books out there, come, come talk to me and we'll have some, we'll have some real talk about the, the challenges. Um, but uh, yeah, so we got, I had, I had an agent and I had another agent and we had gone out over several years and got rejected 38 times um, for many reasons, most of which were, oh, Brad, this is, a, this is a great idea. I wish I had this idea. You're a great writer, but no one knows who you are and um, you don't have 100,000 Instagram followers. And so we can't risk, we can't, we're not willing to take a risk because we don't think we can sell enough copies to justify giving you a book deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it came down to like late 2018 and my second agent at this point had said, well, I think we've reached the end of the road and he was ready. He was giving up. And I said, so I had a moment where I was like, okay, do I give up at this point? What, you know, do I have to just cut my losses? Um, but I just, I, I never stopped believing in the, the vision I had for the book and my ability to pull it off. And so I said, you know, and I come that far, so at that point I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going. And so at that point I went to university of Nebraska, which has published a lot of great baseball books. And actually I'm reading one right now called uh, Boughton by Mitch Nathanson. It's a great biography. If any of you guys, it's a fantastic book. Um, and so I, I knew they did a lot of baseball uh, and I, you don't need an agent to approach them because they're a smaller publisher. Mm -hmm. And so I sent them, I sent Rob Taylor, the editor there, my proposal and within a couple of hours he had written back and said, this is great. I, I love this. Let's, let's get it done. And so I actually wrote most of the book in about five or six months in 2019. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's kind of the, the backstory. And then it's, but you know, it's been enormously satisfying now to see it do well and hit the bestseller list, LA times bestseller list and getting a lot of groundswell of support. Um, you know, it's really, it's really, it feels really good to, to see that after that whole process. So uh, tell me about that. It's what in its, what, fifth print now, something like that? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, so it, it quickly sold out of its initial print run and they've had to continue to reprint it. Um, I'm trying to convince them to, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's this, the, the whole story of the book is con repeatedly trying to convince people to take a chance that I can actually deliver. Um, so I'm mm -hmm. saying, you know, please publish, publish more so you don't have to keep running out of stock and reprinting them. But um, it is back in stock now. It's been going through multiple printings. So um, I'm glad to see that. And I don't know, Zach, there's a bunch of questions that are in the chat here. Do you want me to yeah, tackle we'll, those? We'll or? We'll, uh, I got a couple more for you. And then what okay. we'll do is we'll, we'll start focusing on the, uh, the questions in the second you know, half. Uh, we'll all be... Uh, you know, participant questions. Um, so, you know, you had a proposed, you know, trip to promote this. Uh, obviously, you know, you've been able to adapt pretty well. Um, but, you know, tell me about, you know, what you had planned. Are you still going to do that um, once things clear up a little bit, uh, maybe a, a smaller scale or, you know, what are your thoughts as far as, yeah. you know, because some of them were, you know, player engagements too. Yeah, I know. I was really thrilled that Gary Templeton, Don Carmen, um, Jaime Kokenauer, Rance Mullenix, Lee Mazzilli were all going to appear with me uh, at bookstores to do signings. And hopefully that can still happen down the road. But um, yeah, I'd put together, so I don't know if people know, but the book tour is, is less and less a thing because it's expensive and um, you know, it frankly is not probably the most efficient use of your time to, to sell books, but, and publishers, well, especially a small publisher, they're not going to pay for it. So I had mm -hmm. put in a lot of time to, to design this whole 35 stop book tour over about a month where I was going to pay for it myself. Um, and I was going to go to on another giant road trip. So start in Rhode Island, which is where I grew up and go all the way to Oklahoma city and back and, going to lots of small towns like, or mid-sized towns like Evansville, Indiana and Peoria, Illinois, and, you know, smaller markets where there's a lot of baseball fans and minor league teams. Cause I really, I like going to places like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really unfortunate that that didn't happen, but 
one of the bright spots I was saying before we started is that when several of us found ourselves in the situation, several of us who were, who were writing baseball books, we came together and formed, this is my shameless plug for the Pandemic Baseball Book Club, <laughs> which uh, the, uh, is basically our, our group. And so Anika Orak, who's on this call, and uh, Jason Turbo, who's written a bunch of great books, They Bled Blue and book about the A's, and Eric Nussbaum, who wrote Stealing Home, we all met on social media and said, hey, we're going to, you know, rather than seeing each other as competition, we're going to work together and actually promote each other's books. And so it's been this really cool, you know, we have a podcast and a website and, and merchandise and everything. And it's been this really neat way to get to know each other, but also, you know, what a, what a novel idea. We actually like writers supporting each other and, you know, promoting each other's books. So that's been a nice, a nice uh, effect of, of all of this. And I, I do hope to go on the road down the line when it's possible again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the last question uh, before we open up to participants, um, are you still, you know, other than uh, regarding the promotion of the book, the, the tour that you had, or are you in, you know, fairly regular contact or occasional contact with any of the ball players uh, in the book? Yeah, actually, um, most of the guys that I talk to, I've still kept in touch with. Um, NPR did a story on on the book and wanted to talk to Gary Templeton for it uh, because that's a a big part of his chapter is telling the story about Whitey Herzog and Gary Templeton. And uh, so I was able to reach out to Templeton and he, he, I passed his information on and he got, he's part of that story. He got interviewed. Mm -hmm. Um, I still, I talked the most with Don Carmen, which is, it was my childhood hero. So it's really special to be able to have a relationship, a friendship with him, even now, you know, long after the, the book is done. Very good. Very good. All right. So we're going to open it up to questions right now. What I'll do is I'll go through the chat to begin with, and then um, we'll go through here. Yeah, let's see. Hello, Bill uh, Nowlin member of the Saber board. See that in there. Uh, this is an interesting one. So what does the Iron Sheik do now since you have had to contact with him? <laughs> well, <laughs> the Sheik didn't exactly have a lot of transferable skills when his wrestling career faded. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, The Wrestler, that's kind of the story of all those guys from the eighties in wrestling. Um, well, he, he had a little bit of fame with the Howard Stern show. I think someone mentioned that in chat, but now he's in his late seventies and really doesn't even walk very well. So he's pretty much chair bound. Um, he's in a lot of pain, you know, those, he's pretty banged up from his wrestling career. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, he's still, he's still hanging in there. I still, I still talk to him now and again. All right. Um, who was the nicest player that you interviewed? And let's just say, who was the most challenging? Who, who was the biggest asshole? Instead of the um, word worst, let's just say most challenging. <laughs> <laughs> the nicest guy was by far Jaime Kokenauer. Um, So I was saying earlier that, you know, one of the themes is that uh, the guys that were the least accomplished baseball players tended to be the most, the happiest and most well-adjusted in their post-baseball lives. And Kokenauer's the poster boy for that, in that, um, you know, pretty lackluster, forgettable major league career. You know, but he even, he even basically told me why that was. You know, he's, so all these guys that I met, the one thing they all had was this, this confidence they have this this you know uh, just sort of underlying confidence in their ability and and I think that that is a big part of what allowed them to make the major leagues is their sort of their their belief in themselves and their ability to forget about their failures immediately. Kokenauer openly told me that you know he he could never get out of his head you know he could, guy could throw filthy stuff but he couldn't he, he had no control he was so wild you know he had this great line where you know the coaches were like 
no, just throw a straight fastball. And he's like, I am trying to throw it straight. <laughs> and it's still diving every which way. Um, and so, uh, so Kokenauer was um, so accommodating when I was in Oklahoma before. So he lives in Northwest Arkansas. I was in Oklahoma digging up Don Carmen's childhood. And uh, I get a text message from Kokenauer saying, hey, uh, me and my wife, Jenny, you know, we're, ho we're hosting this, this 4th of July party at the house. You know, would you look, please, I hope you can come join us. And we're going to grill all day. And there's fireworks on the lake that we live on. And it was just like, you would have thought like, this is my uncle, you know, <laughs> that, I'm, that I grew up with. And mm -hmm. sure enough, like, he welcomed me in. Um, I went to an art museum with him on July 3rd. The next day, I go over to his house and we're playing Cards Against Humanity and I'm meeting his old friends and hanging out with his dog. And it, you know, it, was, <laughs> it was just an amazing um, how, how welcoming he was. Um, mm -hmm. On the other side, you would have, on the, on the asshole side, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, Vince Coleman, to me is like the biggest villain in the book. Um, I don't actually get to talk to him, but I do a lot of research. I go to his childhood where he grew up in Jacksonville. I go to his childhood church and his high school, and I do my fair share of reporting on him, but I never get to talk to him in person. And, you know, I guess just to illustrate Vince Coleman, I, when I was in Houston trying to get, get a hold of Gary Pettis, uh, I, the PR guy at the Astro is a guy named Steve Grand, who's a really nice guy, really helpful. And I was talking to him about how Vince Coleman was just giving me the cold shoulder. And he was like, he's like, dude, like, don't worry about it. When he was here as a coach, because Coleman was a base running coach. Yeah. I guess Steve Grand, the PR office would always go to him and say, um, hey, you know, can you make, can you do this appearance for charity or do this? And every time Vince Coleman's automatic answer was, is it paid? You know, because that's, that's all he cared about was like, if, it's, if you're not paying me, I'm not going to do it. Um, hmm. So that was disappointing that, you know, that that's what I found out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you already talked about some of the prep work on there. How many words, was there a particular word goal when you were putting together this book manuscript um, you're trying to aim for? Yeah, I think my contract said, I want to say 90 to 110,000 words. Mm -hmm. And I think it ended up being about 90. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it came in, you know, right where it was you know actually the nice thing was i i mean i've heard a lot of stories from fellow writers about them handing in way over length and i i actually thought like when i first started the book I've, i always was of the mind of like i want to write a long book i want to have like 500 pages i want it to be like a, you know i want to be able to curl that book when i want to get a good bicep workout um and then as I got writing, I'm like, no, like, you know, the, the old adage about less is more that as a writer, you know, you really can be lean and slim. Mm -hmm. I, I was surprised how true that was. I would, I would write something and I'd be like, yeah, you know, if it's, again, if it's not serving that, that purpose of the meaning of the, of the book, then it's got to go. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So here's a, here's an interesting question. So, you know, besides it being, you know, a great adventure for you, but how has it changed your life? Obviously, you, you know, got a book out of it, but beyond that, obviously, there is some you know, development. It's, you know, kind of like a, a life-changing period in your life. Mm -hmm. um, can, tell, me about, uh, tell me about that. How has that effort to put this book together changed you other than, you know, just you becoming a published author? So I'll just start. So when I took the trip, I was 34, single, uh, no kids, living in, renting a room in a house in Oakland. I'm now 39, single, not married, no kids, renting a room in a house in Oakland. <laughs> so <laughs> on, the, on paper, <laughs> my, life, um, my life has not changed very much. Um, 
And in fact, one of the one of the interesting things about even though the book has has sold well, um, I mean, I've been public about my my advance for this book was two thousand dollars. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, writers don't get don't get paid that much, um, but the book is selling well, and I get royalties of ten to fifteen percent on every copy. But the thing is, I only get paid once a year. So wow. I could sell 100,000 copies, which I don't think I will, but I would love to. Um, and I won't see a dime until September. And then I wouldn't see a dime until the following September. So those of you who are interested in the economics of publishing, it's not like you go to the, you go to the mailbox and there's, you know, stuffed with checks. Um, mm -hmm. But to answer your question about, um, no, the way that, I mean, so in, in framing this book, um, I was always very sensitive to being honest and not disingenuous in that you'll find when you in publishing with this kind of book, the, the gatekeepers of the publishing industry always want you to have everything figured out ahead of time. And they want you to figure out the meaning of life in your book. Right? <laughs> and like, you know, books like Eat, Pray, Love, or, you know, where like the woman goes off on her spiritual quest and then she does meet the love of her life and she falls in love. Like, I was aware, like, I'm not going to find the meaning of life or my true love in a, on a seven week road trip to find a bunch of old baseball players. Like, yeah. let's, be, let's be honest about that. Right. And so I was very careful in, in, it, but I also knew that my, my story had to have a narrative arc and it had to have a journey. So I was, I tried to include that, but also be honest about what that was. And for me, the, the payoff or the lesson that I learned is that actually we all have, everyone on this call right now has a lot more in common with Major League Baseball players than they ever thought they did. Mm -hmm. That was the lesson that I learned, and, you know, myself included in that, yeah, none of us, unless um, Vince Coleman's on this call, none of, none of us uh -huh. have, have Major League talent. None of us have that, that you know, extraordinary ability to, to play baseball. But other than that, what comes out of this book is that these guys all deal with the same crap that we deal with, you know, we mm -hmm. relationship issues, addiction, um, you know, divorce, uh, disease. I mean, all these things that are, they're, they're not immune to any of that. And in some ways it's worse for them because of their celebrity. And so because I, I focus this book much more on who they are as people than baseball players. Like I don't really, go you know people may be disappointed but i don't ask steve yeager you know what it felt like to win the 81 world series mvp i instead asked talked to him about his father and how his father mm -hmm. was an alcoholic who passed out in the clubhouse the first time he went to see him play in cincinnati and you know so you get this like you get this this portrayal this understanding of these guys as as humans as people and it demystifies some of that that hero thing that we have but I think in a way that ultimately makes us feel closer to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, you could either look at it as you, you read the book and you, you realize that either we're a lot more special than we realize or major leaguers are a lot less special than we realize, but either way, we're all kind of more on the same level than you might've thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I keep going through here in the comments. Um, did you give any thought to self-publishing after so many rejections? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, so in publishing, you have the big five that give out the big advances. You've got the mid-range to small publishers that give out, you know, zero to $10,000 advances, and then you've got self-publishing, right? And so I had, you know, tried to do the big five, and that was the O for 38. And then it was like, okay, like mid-range and self-publishing. Um, once you get there, you know, you're not going to make really any money on the, on a book deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I guess the question was, if I had, if I had struck out uh, with all the mid range, would I have then gone to self publishing? And I honestly don't know. I mean, part of me says like, yes, because I, as a friend of mine said, like this, this book was inside of me and it had to come out. And then part of me is like, well, I, as much as I enjoy poverty, like I don't like it that much so um, <laughs> well i don't know <laughs> yeah all right i know you get this one a lot too but uh a second book have you ever thought about that 
um, about baseball? Or, <laughs> no, baseball, I mean, I, I uh, uh, a nineteen eighty seven wax it. pack. Uh, right. I've been asked a lot about a, a sequel a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, no, I don't want to do a sequel um, because this, for the same reason, they should never have made Hangover Two. Right. Um, mm. I just I feel like uh, so often creative types go back to the well for the wrong reasons. Like the only reason why this book is good is because I believed in it so much. And I can honestly tell you if I did a pack of 87 tops, I would not believe in it. I would not have the conviction that you need to make a book successful because mm -hmm. uh, I would be doing it for the wrong reasons. Like I think as a creative type, you have to go with what drives you, be, you know, because I mean, I'm not, I'm not in this for the money. I'm in it because I, I, I want to tackle topics that intrigue me as, as a writer and a journalist. And so there are other topics out there that intrigue me, but probably not the same thing. Okay. Okay. Um, did you play ball when you were younger? Uh, not well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I peaked in little league when I was, I was the Ron Washington of the Greenville little league that I loved being up running the bases. Um, and I love defense, but I was terrified of hitting, which is just goes to show you that, you know, my mindset as a kid, a lot of fear, a lot of, not a lot of confidence. Um, I didn't like that the spotlight was all on me at the, at the plate. And so, um, I did not last very long, uh, as a player. Mm -hmm. Um, here's another question about, uh, trademarks and copyrights. Uh, did you come across any, or what were some of the concerns you had too about this? Um, you know, obviously, you know, you're using Topps baseball cards, you know, that's the, you know, basically right. the, the image on the, on the book cover. Um, tell me about how you, you know, got permission to do that and you got, uh, um, you know, rights to use those trademarked images and copyright images. Right. So one thing that I would advise everyone, again, to know if you are interested in, in publishing is um, you, you, you kind of have to do it all yourself. So um, with the rights, Nebraska was like, hey, great if you can get the rights, but that's your job. So I, um, I had actually talked to Tops for a while. They, when they got wind of the project, when I was blogging on the road trip, they, they reached out to me and I had, excuse me, I had some conversations with them. So I, I knew some people there, but then it came down to me basically saying, hey, will you, can we have permission to print images of the cards and then use the, the, the wax pack itself as inspiration for the cover? And they were generous enough to say, yes, you know, you can do that. Um, gave us permission and then we just had to give them like six copies of the book and and they signed off on it so sounds like a good trade yeah i, I was <laughs> grateful absolutely um here's a question so you talked about the friendliest ball player that you talked to who would you could you know would you consider somebody a different ball player most interesting mm. um i mean I really thought uh, Randy Reddy was really an interesting guy because, I mean, ball players, there's a certain mold, especially from that generation, um, that a lot of them fit into. And Randy Reddy broke that mold. Well, Don Carmen, by far, I can get to him later, but Randy Reddy broke that mold in that, you know, he was telling me about how he was going to his uh, yoga class and he was taking hip hop lessons and then he was going to see his therapist because he was, you know, like a lot of these eclectic, but he was also into hunting and fishing it all, all over the board, which I thought was mm -hmm. really, really neat. Um, and then Don Carmen is, is just exceptional. And I mean, how many, I mean, what one, I think one baseball player, Mike Marshall has gotten a PhD in the history of baseball. Maybe there's another one or so, but um, Don Carmen finished baseball, got depressed, started drinking a lot, uh, realized that he was, he was going nowhere, picked himself up, went back to school, got his bachelor's in psychology, got his master's in, in sports psychology, 
and now working on his doctorate uh, in sports psychology and, and is a disciple of Harvey Dorfman um, and is now the, uh, so the staff psychologist for Scott Boris. So he's, you know, when Bryce Harper goes into a slump, as Bryce Harper, all, you know, every player goes into a slump, they will, Don Carmen will fly to whatever city that they're playing in and meet them in the hotel room and sit down and, and talk and do therapy with these guys, even the best players in the world. And, you know, interesting that he said when he meets with them, 80% of what he talks about is not baseball. So he's not going in there and saying, hey, Bryce, you know, when, you, when you're ahead in the count, you might want to modify your launch angle. No, he's, just, he's talking about psychology and sort of the emotional makeup of a player. Um, and so Don Carmen was by far the most interesting. If you read that chapter, you'll get a sense of just how different he is from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So without disclosing any possible confidential conversations you had, I do have a question on there about, um, and I don't recall in the book, but did any of the players bring up anything about uh, steroids or the prominence that they took shortly after their careers ended uh, in the game? No, I don't think, I mean, I'm trying to think of, I don't think any of these guys were under suspicion or, I mean, they really were before that peak or they were playing maybe at the tail end of that. I mean, their careers were, end of their careers were the beginning of that era. Um, I mean, certainly if you see Rance Mullenix's physique, you know he wasn't on steroids, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, we talked about drugs a little bit and mm -hmm. they, guys like Templeton said, Hey man, like, yeah, it was, we did it out. We did it all. But by that he meant more like cocaine and greenies and um, yeah. you know, other, other drugs that were big in the eighties that were more about speed, you know, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, of uh, steroids never. And, and I didn't, I didn't really see that is part of their story. I mean, I, I could have asked them their opinions, I guess, but it's a different era. Okay. Along that top, it looks like there is a question, any like LGBTQ topics that come up about players in the locker room, anything like that? Well, yeah, so the question of, I mean, there probably are players because statistically yeah. you would think that there, there probably are players that I don't think, there, no mm -hmm. one's out, but, um, yeah. and in terms of, I mean, I, we didn't talk about, LGB, sorry, <laughs> LGBTQ um, yeah. explicitly, but we talked a little bit about, I mean, racial issues came up a lot, mm -hmm. right? Because that was- the Gary Templeton, and, yeah. And issues around, I mean, baseball, I think, you know, has, has, had, has been slow to embrace a lot of the diversity and diversity on all of its axes, not just mm -hmm. race. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that these guys are from an era that uh, well, I mean, base, I, think, I think baseball now is recognizing how important it is to change, the, to be less conservative. I don't mean politically. I just mean like more willing to change. Inclusive. Yeah, more inclusive. inclusive on, on everything, right? For whether it's player emotion to, um, you know, di to diversity in a racial sense. I mean, I think it's, they're, they're realizing that to compete with the NBA and the NFL, you you can't overly cling to traditions that may be very antiquated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had a question about how um, how many nights again was it that you were on that trip? How long was that trip? It was seven weeks. So I it was uh, forty nine days, seven weeks uh, on the road. Yep, pretty just consist. You know, one day after the next. Um, someone asked here, do I think? that I could do this on Zoom, um, <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, I this, is, this is one of the things that is so sad about the current state of it. I mean, I don't know how you do any kind of, you know, this kind of reporting and you couldn't do this kind of journalism well in, in this era because again, so much, you know, if you read the book, you'll see so much of, the book is, is description about someone, about the, the environment. So I go, you know, I go to the zoo with Don Carmen and I go, watch Kung Fu movies with Gary Templeton and go to the um, uh, Rick Sutcliffe has me over to his house. And so like, you know, you couldn't do those things virtually mm -hmm. that would be lost. 
Um, another question is, you know, what was some of the most interesting or compelling things that you learned from the actual book writing process? Um, from just the process of writing? Well, um, I mean, I learned, <laughs> I guess I learned how just what a beast a book is um, mm -hmm. that, I mean, I think this type of book, especially I'm kind of envious of my friends that are novelists mm -hmm. because when you write a novel, I mean, yes, you ha it has to be rooted in reality, obviously uh, in some way, but um, you know, you can, you can make it up. And like, I'm in a, I'm in a writer's group with people that are novelists. And I was, when I was writing this book and we were workshopping my chapters, there was one time one of the women in the group was reacting to, I don't know which ch chapter it was, but she was like, Oh, well just make, you know, make him 10 years older. And I was mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, that's not how it works in nonfiction. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so um, I found one of the challenges of writing this type of type of book was I often felt like I was writing two books in one. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was writing, I had to get all, you know, and I was first trained as a fact checker in journalism. So I'm very, uh, aware of of that of of the need to be accurate, and so I was always I was you know in the one sense making sure all of my interviews were transcribed and my quotes were accurate and everything that I said was 100% accurate. That's that's the first part of the book. The second part is then writing a nonfiction book in a way that is compelling, mm -hmm. and emotionally engaging to the reader because this is not just a history book or a reference book. It's meant to you know, be this, this literary narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, just wrapping up. Does anybody else have any other questions? Go ahead and add those in the chat and. Okay. Well, Brad, we really appreciate your time. Um, again, um, it's a great book. And uh, if you haven't bought it, make sure you go out and do so. Um, I think, Amazon will have it in stock on June 22nd, um, but uh, it's also available at your, you know, local indie bookstore and uh, Barnes and Noble. Um, so def or, you know, you could also get the, uh, the Kindle edition or the audio edition now too. You got to, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that one out. How was that, uh, you know, you know, taping that uh, audio book? Do you ever imagine that that would be, something that would be done for this project? Uh, I have new respect for anyone that does any voice talent whatsoever because, so for the audiobook, I, I you sit in a, in a booth about as wide as my desk right here uh, for four days, for six hours a day. And if I even go like this, they make you retake it because like they're, every, the sound is so sensitive. So I had to, you sit there, you know, like a statue, afraid to move. Um, and it's really hard. I mean, like speaking out loud and, and keeping your cadence and, you know, even, even though I, I mean, I managed to do it okay, but I still had to, I probably made 15 mistakes every page. I had to re-record. Re mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, I thought it was really fun to do because I just think it's neat when I listen to books when the author is the one reading it. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to do that. Um, well, it, it sounds like somebody has listened to the, um, the audio book there in the, in the chat. So, and they gave you a thumbs up. So you did a good job. Yeah. I'll, I'll write in here too. I'm going to type my email if anyone wants to okay. email me with questions or anything. And then also another, uh, plug for our pandemic baseball book club. Um, you can see all of Anika's great illustrations for our, uh, for our, on our, all of our different swag. So come check it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's a heck of a book. If you haven't purchased it, definitely go ahead and do it. Thank you very much, man. It's okay. okay. Thank you. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks to and, Zach and Marlene uh, for organizing us. Yeah, uh, well, I, we, organizing us. It's, it's been our pleasure. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Um, Marlene and I are going to plan on doing this monthly, even when we do have um, our luncheons back next month, uh, Tuesday, uh, 
Uh, July 14th, we're going to have Chris Epting, who put together Roadside Baseball, which is basically like a travel companion of various baseball-related related sites throughout the country. He'll be our uh, guest speaker next month, and we hope to uh, have you uh, join us. So I'll be sending that information out soon, posting it on Twitter and the uh, Facebook uh, uh, page for the chapter, and then also the Sabre virtual meetings list. So again, Brad, uh, we can't thank you enough. You did a, uh, a great job with this book, and I'm very happy to you know, see that you're having success with it. One day, hopefully, I'll be interviewing you at a chapter meeting about your book, Zach. So we'll we'll see. We all got projects. It's uh, it's been fun, but uh, um, I'm uh, I'm I'm happy to have you here. You know, today, and it's been fun watching and you know thanks, following Zach. your Thank journey you, on this. Good job. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Well done. All right. Have a great day.